So with that, I'm not going to say too much more about speakers or anything. I'm going to turn it over to Dan McLean, who is the CEO of the Petroleum Technology Research Center, and I'll have him introduce our two speakers. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, thank you, Norm. <clears throat> yes, my name is Dan McLean, and I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar today, wherever you are in the world. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm very excited about uh, this webinar because we have two extremely distinguished speakers here, Dr. Rick Chalaternik and Dr. Don Lawton. These two folks have a long history uh, in the subject matter that they're going to cover. And I know they also ha have a very unique style in presenting this material. So uh, this is going to be very informative. Uh, but to set the stage for this uh, conversation that we're going to have, let me say a few things about the topic. We're going to talk about the Canadian experience in deep and intermediate CO2 storage sequestration. Uh, in, uh, and, and that experience comes from a long history uh, of actually being ahead of the curve. This is an interesting time that we're in right now because the world is knocking on our door to learn more about CO2 storage. I think you all know if you're familiar with the Paris Accord, it was, it was very clearly defined back then that uh, CO2 storage had to play a role in meeting those targets. And the world is caught up to realize that, yeah, this is serious, we need to do something about this. Well, Canada's been ahead of the curve in that area. All you have to do is look at what's been happening in Canada. In Alberta, we have a huge CO2 storage project called Quest. We have the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line System. There is a CO2 uh, EOR project called Clive as a part of that. Uh, CMC Carbon Management Canada, which is what Don Lawton's involved in, is going to talk to you about a project he has in Brooks. And then in Saskatchewan next door, we have the uh, Boundary Dam uh, uh, carbon capture project, the Weyburn CO2 EOR project, which was the largest CO2 project of its time uh, in 2000, and Aquastore. So we've been involved here in Canada in CO2 storage for quite some time. And Rick and Don are going to tell you a little bit about uh, the projects that have been going on. So thank you for taking the time, and I'm going to turn it over to Rick to get started, and uh, here we go. Uh, Rick, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, no, I just was saying it's exactly why the standard the standard uh, Zoom uh, starts is that uh, hopefully the screens and everything and, and the voice was, was working. Norm, that sounds good? Yes, that sounds good. And Perfect, okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, at all uh, for uh, joining us this morning for a conversation um, around some monitoring and storage for CO2. Um, kind of excited to be here with Don. I sort of worked, worked with Don and collaborated with Don for, for lots of years uh, on this particular subject area. So it, uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, my, my role this morning um, is to talk about our experiences at Aquastore. Um, it's a great marriage between, you know, what's happening at Aquastore, which, is, which was very deep uh, three, 3,300 meters um, and, uh, um, you know, not quite the same um, level of, of, of attention to details that you're going to hear from Dawn, uh, but some very exciting results that are, are uh, structured around some dynamic injection that was, uh, that happened tied to the uh, uh, Boundary Dam, Boundary Dam uh, capture project. So it, it, there's a lot here. I have an opportunity with a lot of individuals uh, online to share some experiences. These are, these are little snippets. Uh, we won't be able to get into a lot of the details, but I do want to give you a sense of, of um, the Aquastore project. And, and really, you'll see this sort of third bullet point down to the second last one is really these little snippets of, of examples of what we have been measuring, uh, the kinds of measurements that are happening, and what that means relative to, to CCUS. Um, one of the things that is happening over the last eight, 10 months, maybe perhaps, is that the conversation has changed. Um, you know, there are lots of plans for accelerated uh, capture facilities, lots of conversations, a, a portfolio of options. Um, and as Bob Dylan says, you know, the times they are a changing. Um, and, and I think in the CCUS and the kind of things that I'll talk about and the kind of things that Don will talk about are, are uh, very, very relevant to the sort of accelerated pace of this development. Um, 
to the subject of the, the webinar, um, requirements for CO2 storage. So there have been developments in, in um, standards, uh, you know, going back to the CSA uh, Z741 through to, you know, the, you know, more recent uh, ISO standards that have, have talked about geological storage. Um, and they define a whole range of things over the full operational life cycle of a project, which you can see in the charts below. Um, and so for, for this particular case, you know, what we're talking about is, is in this little portion of this life cycle uh, portion, the start of injection, we'll show you some, some data that happened. Um, and, and what we're interested in is injectivity, containment and capacity is typically the way they're classified. Um, containment can have elements of conformance in it, you know, where the CO2 is going in the subsurface. Um, and, and what you'll see in the, in the highlight of the Aquastor presentations are uh, elements that speak to, to all of those issues around um, suitability of geological, uh, geological sites. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that when you look at the measurement monitoring program and you look at maybe perhaps the things we talk about at Aquastore, things that Don talks about at, at uh, his the field research center, um, the, um, all of these things are around detecting um, unexpected movements. You know, what we're trying to do is gather subsurface information. We're trying to look at the effectiveness of containment. We need to gather evidence um, that we understand how our storage complex is evolving, um, that we, we know where the CO2 is going and we can, we can show that it's going to stay where we said it uh, is going to stay, um, supports risk. Um, and in particular, the, the one thing in particular in Aquastore, which was important for us, is that the monitoring itself actually provided a lot of information for decision support during the project. Um, and you'll see that in, in, in the presentation. So for Aquastore, um, you know, in the early days of planning Aquastore, it was exactly what we, we planned for, the MMV programs, um, uh, there were uh, sort of operational plans, there were some plans around science research, um, science and engineering research uh, objectives, but a lot of them were all um, uh, related to injectivity, capacity and containment, and had uh, containment monitoring, public assurance, and, and some research objectives uh, at the core of, of what was what was happening. So for Aquastore, many of you on the, on the, on the webinar today that may be not familiar with it, um, SAS Power, it's associated with SAS Power uh, Boundary Dam uh, Capture Facility, you can see in the bottom right. Um, and the Aquastore uh, project itself is, is an injection well and an observation well for the subsurface storage component. Um, the majority of the CO2 from the Boundary Dam project goes off to support a CO2 enhanced oil recovery project in Weyburn. Um, so injection, you'll see some dynamic data started in 2015, and we're you know currently in the subsurface um, a little over 370,000 tons. Um, and um, the the wells themselves, for for people who are worrying about these numbers, um, you know, have been designed on the injection well of of roughly 2,400 tons per day, um, and an observation well about 150 meters away. Now, one of the things that was important when we designed the project for Aquastore, the team looked at it was that we knew that this was going to be a situation under very complex and very dynamic operating conditions. We, we weren't in a position to control the CO2 injection. Um, it, was, it was a full commercial project. So when the CO2 arrived, um, and to be in a position that the CO2 needed to go into the, into the subsurface. So, so we knew a great deal of learnings were gonna come from that. Relative to technologies, um, maybe the thing to point out here is that on the MMB side, there's a fair amount of work that's done in advance. So you can see on the far right hand side of the arrow, uh, injection started in 2015. But in fact, all of this, a lot of that front end work, a lot of the thought around what in, went to injection wells, went into observation wells, surface, everything else, um, you know, years before that. And I think you'll find that um, as a characteristic for any of these larger projects, Quest and, and, and others, that there is a significant amount of time in advance that, that goes into this. Um, so lots of technologies, we won't be able to talk about them all today, but hopefully we'll touch on, on many of those um, technologies that were employed uh, in the MMB program at Aquastore. So site configuration. So again, there's the picture, the Boundary Dam site, there's a, a pipeline that comes off the, the uh, CO2 capture plant, goes off and heads off uh, west towards uh, Weyburn. But there is a, an offshoot pipeline that brings CO2 back towards a compression, a sort of a compression facility here um, and an injection well and injects it in the subsurface. And we'll show you some geological details in a minute. Um, but lots of, lots of surface stuff, uh, dedicated surface facilities that looked at uh, surface deformation, INSAR, GPS, 
Uh, I can show you some of the uh, outlines of the sort of larger um, um, seismic monitoring array. There were permanent, um, uh, these were uh, sparse permanent arrays that were uh, permanently in place to help with all of the uh, time-lapse monitoring um, uh, for the site. <clears throat> From a geological setting, uh, we're injecting into the Deadwood Formation, which is a basal Cambrian sandstone sitting right above the granites, the Precambrian. Um, there are th the uh, Black Island sandstones um, uh, that, along with the Deadwood, um, constitute the injection horizon. Um, the sort of yellow horizons that you see in here were the interpreted um, uh, higher permeability zones, if you like, um, and there were four perforation intervals. The grade zones that you see here are where the intervals were perforated for CO2 injection, um, and core intervals were taken up in the caprock uh, intervals, and then one uh, dedicated interval in, in the middle of the sandstone. Um, a bit, bit of a busy slide, but just to give you a sense of what the injection in the observation wells were like, um, the injection well, uh, a tubing, four and a half inch tubing string with a packer down hole, it had a DTS um, uh, string uh, attached to the tubing string, which will be some dynamic data of that, a pressure uh, temperature gauge down here ported to the inside of the tubing string to measure injection and uh, uh, down hole injection uh, pressure and temperature. Um, and there were a great deal of casing conveyed instrumentation on both wells. Uh, on the injection well, there were pressure gauges uh, deployed on the uh, casing side, um, as well as a DTS DAS line on the casing. Um, but some is issues during installation, uh, it was only uh, worked down to 1,640 meters, didn't make it down to the packer level. And in the observation well, um, a DTS line as well went down to 2,850 meters. Uh, casing conveyed pressure gauges, and in particular, a fluid sampling port. This will come up near the end uh, that allowed us to, uh, to measure um, uh, CO2 fluids um, moving past the observation well uh, during the life of the project. But what did CO2 injection look like? Well, it's pretty dynamic. You'll see a lot of these um, uh, heat maps, they're called. So uh, red uh, is warm, obviously, the blue is cold. And what you can see is that as I'm, I'm injecting um, um, the, the the system, so this upper portion here shows the sort of uh, rates. Um, and as I'm injecting, the system will cool all the way down the tubing string and then you shut in with no flow, then the system will warm and then it cools and there's these cycles. And it's those rapid heating and cooling uh, affects the phase behavior within the well bores. Um, one of the things in the webinar I did wanna point out that we've learned, which is really quite interesting is that you can have high rate sampling um, and then for certain purposes, you, you need to select data for history matching and other things. And it's quite interesting that if you're looking at things maybe as local as well integrity, um, if you choose something like daily averages, you, you, you lose the dynamics. Um, so you can see the dot here, daily average, um, doesn't really capture some of the dynamics that happen uh, around the well bore. So depending on what question you want to answer, some of the, the uh, how you choose your time periods for the the analysis makes a difference. Um, phase behavior, some interesting learnings, um, uh, difference between choosing isothermal and thermal. Um, in this particular case, given the way the temperature and the pressure changes during the heating and cooling, we have a, a sort of an instability from the point of view of the phase behavior of CO2. It's, it's less dense at, at depth uh, than it is at the wellhead. Um, and in fact, so what happens on the left-hand side, what you see here is when you shut the wells in, um, you actually get uh, sort of warmer fluids moving to the to this to the uh, uh, wellhead direction. So you get an actual warming at the wellhead direction when the when the wells are shut in because of this density and stability. So there are lots of interesting things that happen um, uh, uh, during during injection for this these materials under this condition that help understand the dynamics of the injection system. Um, one of the other things about gathering a bunch of data like this is the time lapse data um, is that you get all of these pressure cycles, but what that does is provides these increments of fall off periods or shut in periods that allow you some really interesting data to look at pressure transient analysis uh, over time to look at how the system is evolving. Um, one of the learnings that we did get from this uh, had to do with injectivity where um, if you look at this injectivity, you sort of that, that one of those elements of CO2 storage versus bottom hole temperature, because our injection regime cools from the 110, 115 degree bottom hole temperature down to around 70 degrees, 
there's almost an order of magnitude increase in injectivity. Um, a lot of work's been done with this. It's not a viscosity thing with CO2 or anything. It has to do with how the system, the deadwood formation is responding. Um, well, I could say that geomechanically in some ways uh, that, that is helping with the, that injectivity. Um, if you're a wellbore uh, integrity person, um, the part that's interesting about uh, deploying these kinds of MMB instrumentation is that you can even get data uh, based on um, installation of the casing and what, what's happening during that installation. So you can get pressure and temperature regimes while you're installing the casing, and you can, you can capture all of these other dynamic responses that are happening during cementing, such as the uh, cooling of the fluids once you know, some of the uh, uh, cooler fluids from the surface are being circulated in cement, and then the cement begins to hydrate, and it, it starts to warm up, and the pressure starts to fall off towards the reservoir of pressures. Very, very powerful data when you start to look at the details around well integrity. Um, surface and subsurface. Um, this was an important thing for Aquastor, some, some really outstanding work done by David Risk, um, um, who's been doing this for quite a while. But when they started into this, the, the, it was interesting in this particular site in Aquastor when you did this, this from a seasonal, uh, seasonal basis, this was releasing something on the order of 70,000 tons per year um, of CO2 naturally across the site. Um, you know, substantial volumes of CO2 uh, that need to be characterized and baselined, uh, very important, um, but also the characteristics of the CO2. And so when you look at it, the other part that was interesting in this site, why this is important from an MMV point of view, is that when they looked at the uh, isotope uh, signature, and there are other things that have come along uh, that help with, with uh, measuring this, but was interesting in Aquastore is that this Del 14 for the CO2 had a characteristic that was a little odd, for instance, and some really great work by Nadia here actually showed that it was actually biological, microbiolo microbiological attack of the coal bits because we were over top of a reclaimed area for the mine. And it was what was leading to this interesting signature in the CO2. But so in that case, what, what's interesting is, is that that's the importance of that baseline set of measurements for complex sites like this. Um, the other thing that I think is important and I, I think is required uh, pretty much for all, all sites uh, should be um, is this sort of isotope signature of the gases uh, from, from essentially from surface to depth. And this is the signature um, for those compounds um, uh, so that if things happen, you have a signature of where particular gas component um, characteristics are at certain sites so that if CO, CO2 or other gases arrive on the surface, you have a way to fingerprint them um, and, and point out where they, where they may come from. Uh, well integrity dynamics. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the casing conveyed sensors, these are sensors on the outside. Um, if you look at this, um, uh, the black line in here is the internal uh, bottom hole pressure. The blue line is the external casing conveyed pressure. So if you blow that up um, and you look at just the outside casing pressure, you can get pressure cycles, oops, sorry, I mean, pressure cycles of greater than an MPA on the outside of the casing and temperature uh, swings on the outside of the casing that are uh, dropping by 30 degrees. Um, and so what you, what you find um, is that if you look at this in very detailed sense about between the tubing and the outside, you look at something like the, the red and the uh, green line, which is temperature. When injection begins uh, or it gets uh, shut in, you can see that the temperature rises very, very quickly, but both inside and outside, there's a very small lag between this. And as soon as injection begins, in other words, the bottom hole pressure rises, the temperature cools very quickly. So it's very, very dynamic. But what's also interesting is on the outside is you get pressure cycles that are occurring on the outside of the casing. So from a well integrity point of view, some very, uh, very important data. Um, a workover was done, some very important lessons around metallurgy um, in these environments, higher saline, elevated temperatures, uh, corrosion rates uh, can increase substantially beyond uh, the sort of standard amounts. And so there was a great deal of learnings around um, some of those issues uh, during a workover in the project. Uh, salt precipitation. Um, uh, there was a shut-in period. What you're seeing in the video is, is uh, precipitation, salt crystals growing on the inside of the wellbore. Um, this is over an interval that actually did not receive CO2. Um, uh, it, there, was, there was very little injectivity in this particular horizon, but substantial amounts of precipitation. Um, 
And so there are learnings there in sort of multiple um, uh, perforation intervals about CO2, supercritical CO2 in the well, backflow of hypersaline fluids back into the well, what that means for precipitation dynamics. Um, and what you'll see on the next slide is a, a subsequent camera run kind of over the same interval, but what you see is it's very clean. And so there are, there are issues around solubility. The, the, the salt crystals um, that were precipitated in the well bore um, were actually, I uh, could go back into solution very quickly, but this is an interval now um, where this provides powerful information now, what, which perforations are plugged, which aren't and stuff. So from, a, from an operational standpoint, provided a fair amount of, of important information. Seismic monitoring was done like in many places. So there were, were multiple time-lapse surveys done from a baseline, uh, M1, M2, M3, and M4 were time-lapse uh, slices. And so if you look at the way that the time-lapse slices interpreted over at the observation wells or uh, in injection wells, you can see at 36,000 tons, 102, 150, and the most recent is 272,000. Um, so uh, very powerful data to help constrain um, the position of the plume. Um, conducted, I'm going to just I'm going to just put this. Don is going to speak to his his work in this area, but the, a lot of work about configurations for uh, DAS cables. Um, it's a small downhole, helically wound surface trenches with different versions of of wrappings. Um, and trying to understand what that means um, uh, as, a, as a really effective method for, uh, for monitoring. And Don will speak to this in more detail. Um, and the other last part of that, uh, maybe in the standards, I guess, if you like, is this issue around dynamic um, reservoir modeling and being able to update the models on the, on the, on the fly. And one of the things that was learned um, here so far, uh, some great work by um, a fellow who works in our group, Ali Reza, is. Um, um, you know, if you look at our, the model and you take the layer cake, the more simplistic models, and then you say, well, I'm going to put in stochastic uh, characterization. Um, and then, um, you know, we have a particular feature where we think that there are some uh, permeability impairments in, in a particular direction associated with um, the, the uh, topology of the Precambrian shield. Um, and you, you put some of that flexure related um, uh, permeability barrier work in it. And then when you combine it all, you really need to combine both st st stochastic flexure and seismic data to really kind of um, match, if you like, in the dynamic updating, what the reservoir simulation data looks like. Um, but from a learnings point of view, for maybe folks on the, on the webinar, what was interesting is that um, very similar history matches. When you take the injection rate data and you don't have, you have seismic, but you don't have other data, for instance, um, uh, you, you, you basically get very, very similar uh, kind of cumulative gas numbers there. You can, you can, you know, you see the, the sort of sets of simulations over a, a set of scenarios here, um, and you can run multiple scenarios and do that. And so what was important for us in this project, and this is the last little bit of dynamic data I wanted to share with you was we realized that because gauges uh, had, had failed at the observation well, we needed another way to try and measure this data out into the plume. And so th this is a, an important lesson of evolving your MMV program from something that was, uh, you know, initially uh, we had a fluid recovery system casing conveyed. It allowed us early on in the plume passing the observation well to gain some important data about arrival times and stuff. But later on, we realized that we could actually convert this to something very simple called a bubble tube. And so the bubble tube had an automated system. It allowed us to very, very slowly, we had a DTS system in line that, that gave us the temperature profile to depth could make very, very accurate measurements on the density of the nitrogen in the lines. And so, so what we had was, um, we realized here in, in late 2020 that we, we would really like to get some data. And so when we did this, we were able to actually now start to get um, uh, some, some, some sort of valuable data. So the flashing you see here is to draw your attention to the bottom hole pressure in the injection well. And the magenta flashing is the bottom hole pressure measured in the bubble tube location at the observation well. And it was really that the match of this with seismic, the reservoir, the flexure, the interpretation that really allowed us to actually confirm um, our ability in the, in the modeling to, to, to constrain um, this response. But from, for people who are on the, on the line and the webinar who deal with this data all the time, there's some really interesting stuff and you can see you know, that it's catching uh, pressure fall offs, both in the injection well and the observation wells, very, very powerful data to constrain how you're doing the simulations. 
So with all of that, the kind of thing that we're thinking about is, is, is an issue called geosafety, which is an um, initiative that's really trying to understand this issue about uh, the technical challenges of adopting the subsurface for a solution space in, in all of these aspects of, of CCUS, hydrogen, compressed air energy storage, and geothermal. Um, and it's really a lot of the learnings at Aquastore um, are, are pushing us in that direction. So maybe just to conclude, when it comes to MAV programs, um, for sure, as you think about this and, and the more projects that come along, um, you got to know what you're looking for. Um, there are certain cases where it's important to measure certain things at a certain resolution. Maybe other times it's not. Something as simple as bubble tubes. Um, really do in this area, really important just to get started, um, uh, no matter how big the slice of watermelon might look. Um, and, and it really is about injectivity, um, containment and conformance and capacity. They're not... They're not independent, they're integrated, and, and those are the things that are important to think about for, uh, for your site. And so there's some really valuable learnings from Aquastore. Um, I, I, the acknowledgements at the end here, I really want to point out um, PTRC support. Um, PTRC has been um, um, outstanding in leading early days of things like the Weyburn and, and brought all that expertise into leading um, the Aquastore project, Eric and Zainab and others, SAS Power, Darcy Holderness for his support. Um, uh, people in, in our research group, Ali Reza, Gonzalo, and Steve, who've done some substantial work on the, the stuff. And in particular, uh, really a significant amount of acknowledgements to what was called CERC or our Science and Engineering Research Committee, Don White, Ben Roster, and Chris Rocks, Chris Hawks, Jim Sorensen, and, and Kevin Dawes. Um, it, it's just been outstanding uh, individuals to work with. So, so thank you very much. I'll stop sharing the screen and turn that over to... Um, Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, I think we're going to turn it over to Don next. Uh, and Don is going to talk about uh, the, the uh, project that CMC is, is operating. Uh, we have a long history with Don as well as with uh, Rick Shalaturnik, so I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Norm. So uh, we just want to check that um, my screen is visible. He yeah, looks good. Myself. Looks good. <laughs> looks good. All right. Well, um, uh, good, uh, good day, everybody, wherever you are. And uh, uh, it's great to follow with, uh, with what Rick, Rick presented here. We've enjoyed working with Rick for close to 20 years now on a number of projects. Uh, and what I'm presenting today is something at a very different scale than what we're seeing at Equistore. But there's some similarities as well uh, that uh, we've been working on in terms of, of monitoring and, and storage aspects. Uh, so just a reminder that we're sitting here in the Western Canada Sedimentary Basin and this uh, you know, capacity, which Rick mentioned, uh, is, was really worked through by, by Batchew and Stewart and others since the early 2000s. And on the uh, screen up here, you see where Shell Quest is in Alberta and, and uh, uh, Aquastore is sitting up in this area as well, where CO2 is in a supercritical state, uh, which is the most efficient way to store CO2. Uh, and that typically requires depths greater than one kilometer. So you've heard that the aqua store is really deep. It's at, you know, just over three kilometers. Uh, at our site, we're gonna be somewhat more shallow, sitting up here at uh, uh, right near the actual uh, gas liquid phase boundary between CO2 because um, of the change in pressure and temperature. So we'll see that as we, as we work through the presentation. And this really was the motivation for establishing this site. Uh, and it, it really originated by uh, the work that was done back in 2011 through 2013 by the government of Alberta on the regulatory framework assessment for carbon capture and storage and uh, resulted in the uh, Mines and Minerals Act uh, carbon sequestration tenure regulation. And Rick mentioned also the, uh, the ISO standards for storage, uh, all, of, all these really integrated into those, uh, those ISO standard uh, works. And what's important in these uh, is, is the MMB or measurement, monitoring and verification plans, particularly closure, what happens after you stop injecting and ultimately want to uh, pass any liability to, to the Crown. So it's done on a risk based, project specific risk basis, uh, but using all the best available technologies really to monitor right from the reservoir uh, through to the surface and atmosphere. So one of the the question that we uh, came out of that was, uh, well, what happens if, if a deep storage site does have a containment issue? Uh, by the time you detect it at surface, one could argue it's too late. So that was the motivation for establishing, establishing a, a research site to look at monitoring technologies 
uh, in a shallow sense, uh, in the inter shallow intermediate depths. So we're fortunate to be able to get a site uh, in Newell County down near Brooks, Alberta, shown on this map, uh, through a, a land lease arrangement initially with Synovus and now with the Eastern Irrigation District. So we, we have 200 hectares of, of a playground that we can use for uh, the research activities of, of the county site. And really the, the goals were, uh, was to develop and validate MMV technologies as they, as they get developed for storage containment and conformance particularly. And really we're focusing on the early detection of CO2 which might be migrating or uh, loss of containment from a deep storage reservoir. And can we get some idea of the detection threshold? In this case, at a depth of 300 meters, which is our injection depth at our site, uh, and really extend those technologies towards continuous or semi-continuous surveillance technologies for the reservoir cap rock and the overburden. And then because we're so shallow, is there, what's the issue with respect to CO2 migration in the shallow section and the impacts of, on, on groundwater? So the cartoon of, of the, this concept is shown in this slide from uh, one of the IPCC early reports, where we have a, a, a deep storage facility. And then if there was some sort of upward migration, whether this was uh, by a well bore integrity issue or by natural fracture systems in, in the geology, uh, could be detected before it gets to surface and therefore be able to implement a mitigation strategy for the site. So we established this field research station back in 2016 and developed it over the following two years. And we've been injecting very small amounts. Uh, the, the question here is not about storage, but about detection threshold. So uh, we've currently injected only about 34 tons of CO2 because we're so shallow. But we're really looking at what are the technologies that could detect these uh, very small amounts of CO2 in the subsurface. So this is our field site, uh, the aluminum tank is the storage uh, liquid CO2. And then we have a, uh, a flow line that goes through a, a liquid CO2 pump through a heater to convert up the gas phase and then into our injection well. Uh, the fingerprint of the site looks like this on the right. It's a one square kilometer footprint. Uh, the background grid is our baseline seismic uh, grid. And then in the center, our injection well is shown in red and then two observation wells are shown in green. And there's a whole range of different surface and subsurface monitoring technologies that are uh, involved in the site. Uh, we also have a classroom on site. So we uh, use this for training uh, for students and for uh, industry as well. Uh, and the end of the trailer, we have an instrument room where all of the monitoring technologies are uh, assembled in terms of the, uh, the host computers. And this is all internet connected and we can manage this uh, actually from Calgary by and large. So it's very good for uh, student learning and also for training. So the site, uh, we're injecting into a formation known as the Basal Belly River Sand Zone at a depth of about 300 meters. Uh, it's a slide on the left shows the uh, medium grain sandstone, fairly, fairly a massive sandstone. It's just over six meters in thickness. And it's overlain by, by the foremost formation, which is a mixture of, of sandstone, uh, siltstone and coals as shown in this uh, lithological diagram here and a resistivity log uh, you see on the side here. So it's, uh, the seal is an interesting seal because it's really a mixed lithology of, of these different types of, of rocks. So we were expecting that we might see uh, upward migration of CO2 through the, through the seal layers as time goes on. And, and so far we haven't seen that. So the monitoring activities that we undertake here are shown in this slide. I won't go through them all, uh, but it's very exhaustive. Uh, we, and I'll talk just about uh, two or three of these today, but these are really what uh, we want to be working with. And many of these you saw also at Aquastore uh, in terms of the well monitoring and, and, and surface seismic. Uh, also a significant geochemistry work on, on groundwater and soil gas because we are working in the shallow section and looking at trace sewer studies using noble gases. And, and one of my colleagues, Kirk, is doing a lot of work on atmospheric monitoring as well. So a lot of geophysics and geochemical uh, methodologies are being implemented. So the well design, this is very similar to the types of diagrams that you saw from Rick. Uh, our injector well was completed, and this is a cartoon of it uh, with perforations in the basal belly of a sandstone here at uh, 295 to 302 meters. Uh, we have a YouTube capillary line for the DTS on the outside of the tubing. 
Now, piezoelectric uh, uh, transducers, there are two of them uh, on the both the uh, outside of tubing to, to measure the, uh, the, the injected gas temperature and pressure. Uh, these are above the, above the packer. The well was actually drilled to 550 meters because we want to move to phase B ultimately and inject at a greater depth. And these are just details about the, uh, uh, the construction of the wells, of the injector well. Then the two observation wells, uh, the geochemical one was interesting in that uh, we, we established a, a new completion methodology where the bottom uh, part of the well was, was uh, had uncemented uh, casing. So it had a sand pack so we could get direct communication with the reservoir into the, into the well bore. And then it was cemented above this, uh, sent them above the formation. Uh, we have screens across the reservoir zone. Uh, we have pressure temperature gauges both the uncemented sand pack and also above zone pressure monitoring on the outside of casing. So that's what you saw in Aquastore. Uh, we have a stainless steel capillary, capillary YouTube for being able to measure the reservoir samples uh, uh, as well. And then we have an integrated fiber pack with DAS and DTS uh, on the outside of casing as well. So this well is open and that's available for wireline tools. This is our so-called geochemistry well. Uh, the geophysics well similarly has a, a lot of uh, technology is uh, cemented in outside of the casing, so the well bore is accessible. Uh, again, the it's fiberglass completed, so that we could use electrical measurements uh, for monitoring. Or the same integrated fiber pack. Uh, we have different types of DAS fiber, both helical wound and straight. We have a resistivity array across the reservoir and a geophone array across the reservoir as well. And that well is also accessible for wireline tools. So Rick showed you some interesting temperature measurements. Uh, we see very similar things in our well because we are very actually close to the liquid gas phase boundary. So this is a heat map showing the injection cycles along the bottom. And then you see very you know, rapid cool off as we get Joule Thompson cooling because uh, we are forming liquids here too in the bottom of the well and that flesh to gas. Uh, and that cools the well, and we see these really significant temperature changes uh, in the well. And this is a, a question for well integrity and also uh, for potential fracturing in the reservoirs, these te wild temperature changes that we see. Uh, baseline seismic program uh, just showed very nice uh, both elastic and acoustic uh, volumes. Uh, so we can see the basal belly river zone there, which we, is our injection target. Uh, we have installed a lot of fiber. This is what we call disruptive monitoring technology. We have different types of geometries in both the wells and also in a one kilometer long surface trench at the site. So we can monitor both borehole and surface seismic measurements using this fiber. And at this point, because we've injected only a relatively small amount of CO2, we're focusing on vertical seismic profiles. Uh, just the map on the left shows the layout of the of the source pattern. And this shows uh, on the right, the uh, observation wall number two with the geophones mounted outside casing from 190 to 305 meters. And we have fiber in these wells also. So me measuring both uh, DAS and geophone responses from VSPs. And this just shows an example of uh, one of the upgoing wave fields uh, from DAS measurement uh, as a, on a VSP survey. So really distinct upgoing reflections and this Reflection here is our injection target uh, near the base of the well. And then if we uh, can, uh, process these data into seismic sections known as walk away CDP profiles, uh, then what we see immediately from the DAS section on the right is that we have much greater vertical coverage because the DAS cable extends over the whole well bore whereas the geophones are limited to uh, that more restricted vertical aperture. But we see a very similar response, but uh, the DAS enables us to, to uh, record over the full wellbore length. And on a time lapse sense, one of my students, uh, uh, Brandon Coleman Quint, is uh, doing time lapse analysis. And we are perhaps just starting to see a time lapse anomaly by repeated BSP surveys uh, between our injector and observation model. So this is want to say a tentative result because of the amount of injected CO2 at this point. Uh, we also have a surface array of geophones that are doing continuous monitoring as well. And we have a, a quite a large group looking at uh, continuous seismicity. 
and this X array of surface geophones uh, combined with the boreal geophones to be uh, recorded continuously and recording a lot of microseismic events uh, in the tens of thousands uh, over the past year and really understanding what is the source of these. Are these uh, anthropogenic, just industrial related, or are these uh, caused by injection? So the, this uh, technology on the right is the techniques that are being used by our group to really classify the uh, micro seismicity as it, uh, as it gets recorded. And this is just shows an example of uh, what we are seeing. You know, the seismograms on the left are very busy micro seismicity, which we then attempting to characterize as to whether these are uh, caused by traffic or other surface sources or due to injection and work by Jean-Viev and Marie, uh, really looking at uh, locating where there's a source from and the ones that are, are interesting at the site uh, close to the, to the injector well, but they're very shallow. So uh, these are the source points all sitting in the top 100 meters. That's point with very few at the injection zone, but we think this is a potentially uh, uh, geomechanical response to, to injection. And we are, we have fairly high pressure at our injection zone around uh, up to five and a half MPA. I'm uh, also doing a lot of work with electrical resistivity tomography. It's the other technology I'll discuss. We have geophones in the observation well that span uh, the reservoir, as shown here on this slide. And we're doing semi continuous measurements of electrical resistivity. And the slide, this picture on the left, shows a distant, different distances from the observation well. Uh, over a period of time from 2019 to 2021, you see increasing redness, which means increasing resistivity ratio as the CO2 replaces uh, pore fluids, which is which are conductive with non-conductive CO2. We see that increase in the resistivity. So a very powerful method for uh, being able to observe the arrival of CO2 at the observation well. And this figure on the right just shows the inverted uh, uh, CO2 saturation uh, that we get from the wells uh, from here, going from the observation well to the injector, uh, being able to track where that CO2 is going in our injection zone. And what's interesting, if we look at the cumulative injection uh, shown on the bottom and then related to the resistivity ratio, uh, which is increasing as you would expect, and then convert that to saturation. Over these times when we weren't injecting due to uh, the various issues at surface, but we see actually a decrease in the resistivity ratio as we're starting to see that the CO2 dissolve in those pore fluids. So uh, ERT is a very useful method uh, for early detection. And we can confirm this with some of the wellbore reservoir uh, modeling that's being done by, by Syed, one of our team members, looking at uh, the pressure and CO2 saturation profiles away from the wells, so the injectors on the left, and then reaching our observation well here, pressure on the left, CO2 saturation on the right. Uh, we're at, you know, the saturation levels are very similar to what you get from the, uh, at the observation well from the inversion of the ERT data. So just to bring this to a close, we're getting to our time limit here, so there's some discussion. We're, at this, this stage of our development, we're starting to be able to rank the various monitoring technologies with respect to effectiveness and cost. Uh, we can test these new technologies, particularly uh, ones that are related to fiber installations, moving towards continuous surveillance. We certainly are at the detection threshold using electrical resistivity tomography and just on the edge, I'd say, for seismic. Uh, and the, really the goal here is to provide the public and regulatory assurance about containment security as, as one of the key elements that Rick uh, mentioned in his presentation. And then with MMV, how often and, and how much do we uh, install for major uh, CCS projects? And really the goal here is to accelerate implementation of CCS to meet the 2050 goal. We have a large team of people who work with us at the site. Uh, this is just a summary of, of the institutions that uh, we work with from different research environments. Uh, it's very interesting and, and a widespread team. And we're also supported by industrial JIP. This shows our current industry members and also uh, really a lot of support from the federal government and through the University of Columbia Global Research Initiative that, that support our operations. And our team, the large group of people, uh, as you see listed here, I won't go through them all, but uh, really a dynamic team, both at, uh, at, at CMC and at the University of Calgary, working with uh, the researchers from all the other institutions. And 
Uh, we do have a YouTube video if you want to look at the details of the site that's listed here at the top of the display. And we're, of course, uh, all these sites, uh, research sites, we're always uh, looking for funding. So we, we hope for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. So I'll pass it back to Norm. Great. Thank you very much. Both excellent presentations. We've had a number of questions come in, actually over 20. I'm actually going to ask a few. I mean, um, of course, Don and, uh, and Rick, you're welcome to kind of look. If you look at the answered section of the Q&A, uh, they're usually not answered. I simply put in a single sentence reply that said, I will try to ask this during the Q&A, but we may have to reply uh, via email later. But um, I'm curious, um, uh, there's two or three people who asked, were there monitoring technologies that you feel could be discounted on the basis of the research that you've done? I know that uh, Aquastore is seen as the Cadillac. I'm sure you've got way more MMV than you need because you're testing things, Don, at your site. Is there any technology or are there any technologies that you would say really aren't necessarily needed in MMV at CO2 storage sites? Uh, don't, I don't think we're far enough away without, along with outside yet to discount any of them. Uh, I mean, some of them are going to be uh, are local to the well. So this gets into this question of uh, where's the greatest risk in CCS projects? Is it around the injector wells? Or, and if we're injecting on a, on a large scale project for 20 years, then the, uh, do, do we need to monitor elsewhere uh, away from the injector wells? So some of the technologies are really going to be specific to the injector wells or the pro proximity to them. So uh, there's those ones that may be discontinued after the, uh, we're certain that there's no containment issues related to the injector wells. Uh, so it's a bit early for us to say uh, which ones we could not use, uh, but we hope to better do that uh, over the next year or two. Um, yeah, I would, I, I guess I would echo that a little bit. Um, you know, the installation, the installation challenges in Aquastore are um, a little different. Um, 3,350 3, meters deep um, drilling those wells had a, 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 a different risk profile. Um, and, um, you know, they, we, we could chat another time about the drilling, the drilling challenges of, of getting through the prairie evaporites and the squeezing of the prairie evaporite salts on the drilling and the under reaming that was required. It was substantial. Um, it puts a risk to the installation of instrumentation. So, um, I, I would I would suggest that that it, it's a serious conversation uh, about where the most important data is required to inform the risk um, structure that that um, that Don was referring to. Um, I would probably say that in 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 future projects of of this type, I would probably be less inclined to run as much casing conveyed instrumentation as we did. Um, uh, I think it's becoming a pretty standard place these days to run. Uh, capillary tubes on the outside containing some level of fiber, um, but you know even those, um, you know whether in CO2 projects those represent leakage paths, uh, I'm not sure, but um, I, I I would say that the one other uh, maybe just to be challenging to answer your question, Norm, um, uh, I I think the one thing that was important learnings for us so far was was the, the ability to have that the bubble tube thing um, system provide us a pressure measurement 150 meters away, even inside what was a reasonably mature uh, uh, um, CO2 plume, at least in that geometry, is that that its ability to constrain what was happening to a steam, cham steam chamber, I'm thinking thermal already, um, CO2 uh, plume that was anisotropic in all dimensions, laterally, vertically, different horizons, um, it, it was, it was, it was extremely important. Couldn't do it. You know, you could get part of the way there with some of it, but that one particular data. And the reason I say that it's a bit, a bit of a, um, challenge, I guess, is that if you think of quest, for instance, in their decision-making made a, a, a conscious decision, not to penetrate the cap rocks with an additional well for observation. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, there, I, you know, I'm with Don. I mean, there's not a definitive answer at the moment, but that's an interesting learning from Aquastore that would suggest, you know, you, you're, it's, it'd be an interesting thing to balance where the conversation comes from relative to conformance, containment, um, you know, all those other issues, uh, whether you put some MMV there or not. So, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know yet. I, I think we'll find we're at a relatively small volume. You know, right. Quest has put in a lot of, a lot of CO2. Yeah. Where we're only at 370,000 uh, tons, so you know we'll see as as time evolves if if we can make more more definitive statements about what may or may not be required. 
Great. Yeah, just okay, one quick, uh, one other quick, tiny follow-up. Uh, you know, it gets to the question of the post-closure monitoring as well. What uh, what happens, especially you know, in cases where uh, liability passes back to the crown, they want to know exactly that it's secure. So, uh, what monitoring is involved, and do you do a large three D survey over the entire plume or not? That would be expensive, or do you do you high grade it to areas where you think there is risk? Yeah. Well, that's actually a perfect lead into the next because there was two or three. Uh, people who raised questions. Uh, this is Stuart as well, Stuart Gilfillan from uh, from Scotland, but there was a couple of other people. What is the current thoughts on the fate of the CO2 within the Aquastore site, like long-term fate? And, and at the moment, how much of it remains free phase, how much has been dissolved? But also other questions from other uh, attendees here about what about long-term fate of the CO2, like when the operations are closed? Um, what What kind of a program can be expected for continuing to monitor this later to make sure that it's not leaking in the long term. So. Well, I, you know, I, you know, early days in Aquastore, but I would say that, you know, from the definition of a storage complex, which is important, I guess, you know, Don and I didn't talk about it relative to projects, but you need to define a storage complex that, that does not just include the primary cap rock, um, you know, in our storage mm -hmm. complex at Aquastore uh, includes the prairie evaporate same way that the storage complex in Quest involves the salt. Um, so, so I think from the point of view of subsurface containment, um, you know, uh, substantial security. I mean, it, it, it's a, from a storage complex point of view, that does not mean that there might be, uh, you know, intermediate movement over the very long period of some shales that were sitting right above the deadwood, for instance, but within the storage complex, which is very still very deep, um, uh, 2,800 meters or something like that, if I, I get it exactly. Um, I, 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 I just not an issue. Now, phase distribution, free phase and dissolved phase, um, you know, with the history match dynamic reservoir modeling, we can get some estimates of that. I don't have that at my fingertips, uh, Stuart. I know you asked the question. Um, but the fact is, is that if we can constrain the reservoir, the dynamic reservoir modeling to multiple levels of, of MMV, um, and have some sense that we we have a, a have a compositional sense of where the CO2 plumes are. Um, you know, we can make estimates of that, and then that will change over time. Of course, when the dynamic pressures res, um, um, fall back to hydrodynamic mm -hmm. regimes and and all the rest of it, and capillary trapping and residual trapping and capillary trapping all happen. So, great. Yeah. So we're, so what we're seeing uh, even in the ART profiles is. Uh, uh, this this drop in resistivity when we have shut-ins, so uh, that is probably due to dissolution of the CO2 into the fluid. So that'll be a real lab case of look at the what are those rates, uh, even at a small scale. Great. Okay, and it looks like uh, Zainab just pointed out to me. There's one specifically for Don. Have you applied <clears throat> gravity to the CAMI site? Is there any reason that you've not done this? Uh, would uh, like to think it's from uh, Anna Kari. So. Good question. I would like to, uh, the, for our site, the, uh, given the thickness and likely density change, the gravity signature is quite small. So uh, we have been looking at trying to get a superconducting gravity meter uh, to come to site. We'll be on a fixed pedestal and just be able to run that continuously during the injection program. So it is something that we've considered. Uh, we just haven't uh, uh, had the opportunity to install one of these inst instruments. So that's a good question. Good. <clears throat> um, Rick, I, I, I think this is a question that um, won't, because I believe we're doing DAS at the site, but it was from uh, Henry Montpetit. Uh, do you think that there would, that you would be able to determine more useful information from incorporating DAS on top of the DTS if you were able to get it at depth at Aquastore? I believe we we have those at well, depth. We do. We, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I just didn't have time to share that. I mean, it's, much, yeah. it's much like Don's, uh, Don's case is, is DAS, DAS is being used, but we only... Um, in the observation well where it's predominant, um, uh, the, the, the DAS fiber only made it to 2850, 2850 meters. And so we're at the sort of 3250 meter ish range for the, the middle of the deadwood. Um, and so, yes, it, it would have benefited um, from having DAS completely across the injection horizon. Um, there are fancier technologies these days that people are using for oriented perfing and everything else to protect the cables. There's, you know, some fancy stuff that's being done, but, um, you know, in 2012, when we were thinking about it, the risk, the risk for damaging the instrumentation relative to uh, oriented perfing and stuff didn't, didn't get us there. So we're, we're down to 2,850 meters. 
and and Don White, who is the kind of the seismic uh, expert on our um, uh, CERC committee, you know, has been has been utilizing DATS for sure. And on the surface, I mean, that that surface stuff that you saw Don talk about, and and we had an Aquastore. Well, well, that's all. That's all DATS. That's right. all. So just, uh, I mean, the, as Rick mentioned, uh, DAS or any fiber is, uh, in terms of well integrity, the uh, having these thin uh, lines on the outside of casing is less of a well integrity risk than big bulky geophones. So in terms of some of the uh, those aspects of monitoring, uh, fiber has advantages. Great. Okay. Oh, well, we have another one here for you, Don, uh, although I'm sure Rick maybe will have some uh, uh, comments because uh, Aquastore has not had much measurement of um, micro seismic events, but um, someone's asking whether you can comment further on the origin of the micro seismic events you've had at 500 to 100 meters and what the magnitude of those were. Yeah, I think that's from Pat. Yeah, hi, Pat. Uh, uh, so we're currently working on that. What we saw was uh, a, a, a very busy micro uh, a number of events uh, during the spring last year. And we think it could be related to uh, thaw cycles uh, to some extent, uh, but the fact that it was constrained close to the injector uh, suggests that it's, it's more of a geomechanical effect and we really haven't updated a good geomechanical model. So if you'd like to help us, that would be, that would be great. Um, uh, so we don't see a lot of events at this point uh, that are originating uh, at the depth of the injectors, there are some, but not a lot. Uh, we're still discriminating between those that are caused by, by just other surface operations versus uh, those due to subsurface uh, and, and Norm, just, just to clarify, <laughs> yeah. there have been lots of micro seismicity measurements at Aquastore. Right, yeah. Lots. Yeah. All, uh, surface, surface related downhole. We've run uh, a dedicated Carina fiber uh, for some of the high rate injection tests. Uh, we've had dedicated geophone uh, installations in the observation wells. N nothing, no, no yeah. detection of micro yeah, that's, that's Sorry if I said that wrong. Yeah, that's what I meant to say is that we have continuous um, seismic happening at the site or seismic measurements happening at the site, but yeah. that we don't seem yeah. to be hearing anything. We don't seem to be seeing anything. So um, there's a couple of questions uh, about the well and uh, the, the well corrosion, what was happening with the well uh, with CO2. But um, the one of the questions is, is are we only seeing Rick at the Aquastore site salt precipitation during shut in periods or does it also precipitate during injection? Do we know? Well, the experience between the camera runs, for instance, would suggest that it does not happen during injection. It, it, right. it probably, there, there is going to be some level of, of precipitation of some sort happening in the pore spaces. Um, right. And there's ongoing work to look at that. But definitely in the well bore, we think it's related to the, to the, um, the fact that there's an interval that actually didn't take CO2 for, for uh, it didn't initially. So most of the CO2 is going into other routes. And so when you shut the well in, there was actually backflow. You pressured up part of the reservoir and you were actually backflowing hypersaline fluids back into the well bore that were dripping back into uh, basically supercritical CO2, which led to precipitation. Now, the, the stuff that's happening out in the reservoir, there are a whole bunch of other mechanics that are happening on the increase in injectivity that's happening. We, we cool by 60 to 70 degrees. Um, I think we're pretty much convinced that in the deadwood um, at, at near the well bore and stuff that there, there's potential thermal induced fracturing occurring, that it's just, it, it's just swamping, swamping any of this sort of poor scale um, uh, precipitation kind of effect happening. So, but, um, but no, we, the, the stuff you saw in the video, pretty much related to shutting events, but okay. So the first one was a four month shut in period. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happens is if you're a dedicated storage site and your capture plant goes down and you really go south with the capture plant and it's down for a year, well, then you should be thinking about remediation activities. You should be thinking about, um, I don't know, injecting something, um, I don't know. Some, something to dissolve the salts. Well, I don't know, warm water. I and mean, what do you do when, uh, when you're, when you're, you're, you know, trying to dissolve salt in your uh, uh, cup of water, right? You heat it up. So maybe hot water uh, injection or something to manage that part of, of the operational decision uh, stuff. So, so there is those components. Right. Right. Um, there's been a few questions uh, about the differences between, I guess this would be more for Rick than for Don again, um, between CO2 EOR and the Aquastore project. Uh, 
Oh, what, yeah. Rick, could you say anything? What's the difference in MMV? Is there any major difference in your experience with Weyburn versus Aquastore? Oh, oh, I think so. I think that's it's the classical, classic description between um, basically starting starting right from scratch, if you like, on the saline side of things. Right, you're doing site characterization. You're planning for the program. You need to you, you need to plan up front. Where in generally for CO2 enhanced oil recovery, you're utilizing existing infrastructure. Well, you might have additional wells you may want to drill, but so your your risk profiles, your MMV program are tied to a different set of, of, of assets. And, and so, yeah, no, I think there is. I, I, I think there are even, you know, hopefully um, by a, a lot of people that the regulatory or sort of policy requirements for CO2 EOR are slightly different. But, um, you know, but in the end, um, to sort of reinforce Don's point, um, at the end, in a closure type scenario, you still have to prove that the CO2 is is where you said it is, and it's going to stay where you said it's going to stay. So, right. so at some point, your MMV program has to be sensitive to those aspects, whether it's CO2 EUR or yeah. saline aquifer storage. Right. Right. Any any final comments, Don? I think we will not ask additional questions. We had a total of about 43 here and I have kept track of them. You will get replies, if not from Rick and Don, then from some of our other technical people, um, just so everyone knows, because we've reached 10 o'clock here. But uh, Don, yeah. any, any closing comments? Or? Yeah, I've seen some of the questions. I'm happy to answer them uh, yeah. as, you know, after, offline. But uh, no, was, uh, I think uh, I appreciate the audience and uh, uh, these these projects, are, we're right at it, as, as, as Rick mentioned at the outset, uh, uh, we're really at a, at, a, at a turning point on on development of CCS at scale. If we look at hundreds of projects, right? Uh, how do we do it? Yeah. And any final comments, Rick? Well, to that point, um, yeah, early on, uh, and Don will remember these early days. That that for people who are contemplating this, um, it's an exciting time. There is the price of CO two is going up. There are tax incentives coming down the pipeline, similar to the United States, I suspect. Um, there are policies and strategies and road mapping. And what will happen is, is that we need to be very careful when we pursue this at scale, that there is not uh, an oops. Uh, very, mm -hmm. all, very early on when we started this, the, this early, you know, the first days of the Weyburn project, uh, 1999, 2000, and, and certain other projects happening around the world, everybody took a lot of care to make sure that you might have called them gold standard, but you wanted to make sure that there were no oops because this is under such scrutiny, and as it should be, um, that that you know, if if we don't pursue this very very carefully, very very effectively under multiple types of settings, um, if there is an oops, th this will affect the the entire CCUS industry on the storage side. Right. It, it will. Um, the 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 public confidence uh, will be eroded very very quickly, and and so. I guess that's just the, the that's the hope that projects like Don's and projects like Aquastore are yeah. going to feed this information into um, uh, projects where people are thinking about doing um, well multiple um, types of projects in the future. Great. Well, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for uh, attending. I'd also like to thank the people who have really helped me a lot in setting this up, Ruth and uh, Zainab and Eric and my boss Dan for uh, for helping uh, this project go forward. Uh, Dan, did you want to say a few closing comments here? And I'll just say to everybody, you, I will maybe stay online myself after everyone signed off. If you continue to want to type in questions, you're welcome to do that. And then, uh, then I will shut it down and I'll make sure all those questions are put into the spreadsheet. So Dan, any closing comments? Just to say thank you to both Don and to Rick for, for sharing uh, these two, the two interesting and, and connected projects. One being a storage research project and the other one, a project designed to try and make this thing leap. Uh, you know, the, this is covering the gamut of what could potentially happen. And uh, maybe just to, to, to echo what uh, Rick just said, it's all good until it isn't, you know? And that's the whole point of this, is to make sure that it is always all good, that we are we understand what's going on in the reservoir, what, what is happening and what could potentially happen and, and uh, ultimately not have to deal with any kind of mitigation. The other thing I wanted to say is just thank you to both of you uh, because this is, this is what we wanna see is a, uh, 
uh, comparing and contrasting and collaboration between Alberta and Saskatchewan projects. This, this is a, 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 an understanding of a technology that spans the provinces. We're, we're blessed in this country with having big uh, reservoirs or, or places where we can store CO2. And the more we share and understand about what's going on in these resources, the better. So thank you both again for, for sharing. Thanks, and thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. As I said, I'll stay on just for a few minutes. Everybody else is welcome to sign off as you need to uh, in case there's additional questions that get typed in and then. Uh, this webinar itself as a recording will be placed at the PTRC's YouTube page and probably, I think Ruth would agree, at uh, your YouTube page uh, uh, early next week after I do a bit of editing on it. So thanks. Thanks, Norm. Thanks, Norm. Thanks, Ruth. Is that right? You're going to post it at your page too? Yeah, we'll post it on our page as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. And fill in the survey if you can when you sign out. Thanks.